This is episode 18 of Chris Sweeney Talks 2. Today I'm joined by Robert Lidman. Now, he's a very well-known figure in the Quebec political scene. He was a member of their National Assembly. He was also the mayor of the, ci- of the city of Côte saint Lucas in Quebec. And um, he also co-founded the Equality Party, which is now disbanded. And he's also an architect to trade. So we're delighted to have him along today. We're going to discuss something called Bill 96. Now, Robert, this is a very controversial thing for people outside of Quebec or even Canada. They may not be aware of this of this legislation. Could you maybe give us a brief overview of it? Because it's 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 quite extreme. Um, and I think people will be surprised it's happening in Canada in 2022. By all means, and uh, thank you, Chris, for having me today. It's a pleasure to be with you and all your listeners and viewers. Uh, Bill 96 is a new law that was adopted by the Quebec government that changes Bill 101. Bill 101 is called the the Charter of the French Language, which was a famous piece of legislation that was adopted in 1977 by the province of Quebec. And what it did was to bring in a series of measures to, I guess, protect and promote the French language and culture in North America, because as you know, uh, the province of Quebec is somewhat isolated in a large sea of English in North America, and successive governments have sought to protect and promote uh, to some degree the French language within this uh, North American context of of English, a North American uh, US culture. Many people, however, though, felt that uh, Bill 101 and some of the language laws in Quebec go somewhat too far in restricting or diminishing the use of English and the impact it's had on the English-speaking community of Quebec, as opposed to really protecting French. And that's where this this fine line exists, or that equilibrium exists between how do you protect and promote French without infringing on the rights of the minority communities, which are Anglophones. And many Anglophones in Quebec feel that Bill 101 at the time, and now Bill 96, go much too far in trying to protect French. And many people see it as a as a measure or a law that won't succeed in protecting French, but will only weaken uh, the Anglophone or the English speaking community of Quebec and further diminish or trample rights with more severe language laws. Yeah, because I mean, I think, I mean, I, I mean, obviously I've been to Quebec um, as we were talking off camera before we started and I'm aware of it, but I think a lot of people outside of Canada, when they go to Quebec or they go to Montreal, the major city in Quebec, I think they're surprised by the level of French. When, when Although it's in North America, I mean, French is by far the dominant language. When you arrive in Montreal or anywhere in Quebec, you can't fail to see French signs, people talking French. It's it's not a mi- it's not a minority thing. This, I mean, it's the, the English is actually in the minority, which I think maybe a lot of people don't appreciate. Yeah, see, English is very much a minority uh, language in Quebec and throughout the institutional of Quebec, the government of Quebec, and most uh, government institutions uh, work or operate exclusively in French. And, and there are many people that are in favor of the independence of Quebec, for Quebec to become an independent country, and they want more and more and more. They want to weaken and dilute more and more and more the remaining English-speaking minority in Quebec, and they want to bring these laws even further. And that's the that's where many of us object. You know, it's, certainly it's valuable to protect the French language and culture in North America, which is predominantly English. But at the same time, it's not a zero sum game where to protect French or the French language, you have to diminish or weaken English or the English speaking community. And that's where there's a lot of tension and stresses between the two uh, linguistic communities here. Yeah, well, I mean, I mean, if we actually look at Bill 96, essentially it says that all your services when you speak to the state have to be in French, apart from your health care. And there's a caveat, if you're an immigrant, you've got six months to, to sort of have a, have a free pass, shall we say. But after that, if you want to get a driving license, you want to complain about your bins, mm-hmm. you want to talk to your children's school teacher, it must be in French. Yes, it's very restrictive from that point of view. And then there's the question of what is the definition of an English-speaking Quebecer that should still have that right? So the government is putting in uh, fairly restrictive measures that only if you've been educated in English in Quebec or in Canada will you have the right to communicate with the government in that language. So that already sets apart a number of English-speaking Quebecers who maybe haven't had their English education uh, in English in Canada that are being put at a disadvantage because especially when it comes to healthcare. And in stressful situations such as that, uh, you you need to rely on your, your mother tongue sometimes. Even though most Anglophones in Quebec speak French, in moments of, of stress and duress, it's hard to speak in a second language sometimes. So there's got to be some flexibility there, but the government hasn't shown any opening to be flexible on that type of thing. And also with regard to immigrants, immigrants from England or, or Australia or the United States that come to Quebec only have a grace period of six months 
before they'll be able to communicate with the government in uh, in uh, uh, in French, and that's uh, a severe detriment as well. So it's something that will also repel people from wanting to come to Quebec. We have to attract. Uh, great minds and researchers and professions. There's a labor shortage here too. How are we going to attract immigrants to come here if we've got all these restrictive measures to people coming here that they've got six months or else? And at that point, you won't be able to communicate with the government in your language. Yeah, because I mean, I mean, it's, I mean, it's, it's physically impossible. Well, not physically impossible, but it's highly unlikely anyone is going to have a grasp of French in six months that they can communicate um, in depth about important things, maybe about immigration or about your child's education. I mean, it's, it's not going to happen, is it? I mean, it's you, you can't learn a language from 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 scratch in that time to be comfortable to that level. Yes, that, that restrictive aspect of the law is extremely unfair and it will penalize a lot of people. Not only it will penalize Quebec too. We have a labor shortage here like everyone else and we've got to reach out to the rest of the world and bring people to this, uh, this province. But that's uh, virtually impossible. The government has to be flexible. Yes, they should put in place uh, free French courses to all immigrants who want to come here and learn French, but you've got to give people the benefit of the doubt. Not everyone uh, has uh, language as a strength and it certainly takes a lot more than six months to master a language, or at least to be able to comprehend and discuss a language well enough to communicate with the state. Yeah, because I mean, I mean, if I'm reading Bill 96 correctly, I could speak English and say the the teacher could speak English, but because I've been in I've been in Quebec more than six months, we have to speak in French. I mean, that's what the law is saying. Even though there's a common language that we could both use, we're not we're, we're by law we're not allowed to use it. Yeah, that's uh, that's the law. Now, the government has been trying to uh, backtrack a little bit lately by saying that they'll be open, they'll be flexible. But, you know, words are words and laws are laws. So what's written in the law is one thing. And certainly I can foresee situations where you might be in a hospital waiting room or you might be in a store or you might be in a business and someone there might feel... Uh, Someone who's very much a hardliner might say, look, uh, the law is the law. I can't speak to you in your language. I'm sorry, but uh, you want a blood test? You've got to speak to us in, uh, in French, whether you can or cannot. And that obviously will set up situations of conflict and difficulty for a lot of people living here. And uh, it's certainly unfair. And we're hoping uh, that people internationally and, and other people raise their voices to make Quebec, the Quebec government realize that they're shooting themselves in the foot too, because we're turning off the rest of Canada. We're, we're tarnishing our impression worldwide because when we want to be open to newcomers or or the outside world, we're doing everything uh, to um, to go against that. Well, I mean, I was I was watching the premier of Quebec, uh, you know, Francois Legault, and he, he did a press conference. I, th I think it was yesterday, and one of the quotes he said was, "What I'm trying to do is to make sure we keep French as the common language in Quebec." And he and he also mentioned he touched upon monitoring what language people speak in their homes. And you start to have visions of like East Germany and North Korea where, where people are being monitored in their homes. And also the fact that he says, I'm trying to protect French. French is already the dominant language. So, you know, you're, it's already so dominant in Quebec that do you need to protect it? You know, do you know what I mean? Well, look, the North American uh, language and culture is predominantly English. So there's a lot of uh, sense of insecurity among some Francophones that one day that will just become pervasive and culturally too strong to resist. But at the same time, Quebec uh, right now is predominantly French. So I think in the short and medium term, there's no, there's no issue. What he was getting at, and it, it, was, it was scary because for the first time we've heard uh, Quebec politicians start talking about monitoring the language spoken at home. Now that uh, steps on a slippery slope and uh, we can only imagine where that can lead. And, and many people uh, were very concerned about that statement. Uh, I think um, we have to monitor and uh, follow up with the Premier to see what he's talking about. What, the, what does that mean? And, and that's a grave concern to many people. You know, the government also um, passed a resolution about verbal communication not that long ago, because in Montre Montreal is about 60-40. Uh, There's a large, uh, most of uh, English-speaking Quebecers live on the island of Montreal. So Montreal is fairly cosmopolitan uh, with a lot of languages spoken. In particular, English is, is a, an important language in Montreal, albeit French is still the majority. And many shop owners, for that reason, on the island of Montreal, use the term when you walk into the store, bonjour, hi you know, in both languages, which are very nice greeting. It's a nice bilingual greeting, which is very welcoming to everyone. And the Quebec National Assembly, the politicians, including the premier, adopted a resolution which was passed unanimously in the Quebec National Assembly saying that bonjour high should be outlawed. So they're obviously, they're starting to walk on that slippery slope of trying to regulate verbal communication, which uh, is a dangerous path to walk down. And he mentioned the other day, 
speaking language in your home, that is of great concern. And I think there has to be some pushback against that. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, you know, maybe I'm taking it too far, but the words sort of fascism came to my mind where, where people are monitoring what you're speaking in your home. I mean, that is, I mean, particularly for a place like, particularly a city like Montreal, there's a lot of immigrant communities. People are speaking their languages. So it's not just English. People may be speaking Spanish, Italian, Portuguese, whatever it may be. But I mean, when you're, when you're monitoring what people are speaking at home, it's, I mean, it's, it, 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 it's taken it very far, isn't it? It's worrisome. Look, Quebec is still a democratic society and the Quebec government uh, is still... Uh, somewhat open, and I wouldn't go down that road of, of equating it to fascism by any stretch, um, to be honest. But, you know, when you look at this thing, keep in mind that um, we have charters of rights and freedoms in this country, too, that protect the minority language rights, that protect freedom of expression, that protect freedom of religion, freedom of assembly, and all those things. And many people are also concerned that this law uh, goes too far in watering down the charters of rights. Not only that, it invokes what's called the constitutional notwithstanding clause. There's a clause that says, despite what the charters of rights say, that the government can pass any law it's called the notwithstanding clause. And governments sometimes use that as a last resort if they feel the courts, uh, a court ruling or an individual rights ruling maybe went too far. But in this case, the government used it proactively or preemptively with the law when they passed the law so that any challenge uh, with regard to minority language rights will be thrown out by the courts automatically. And that's of grave concern as well. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, yourself, I, I mean, obviously you speak both French and English, you know, you're, you're bilingual. So maybe, maybe you could put, you, maybe we could ask you, you know, sort of if you could put you in the headspace of people that are not, not in Quebec. You know, when you go out in Montreal, when you go into a shop, are you prepared for both languages? Do you have an issue speaking in the language? Is it, is, it, is, it, is it something you think about or do you just switch no problem as you go along? I, I usually address people in their common in their um, uh, preferred or mother tongue. So I, I'll start in French typically, but uh, if I'm speaking to an English speaking Quebecer, I'll speak to them in English. But it's very interesting how in uh, Montreal you often see two Anglophones, two English speaking uh, um, Quebecers speaking to each other in French until they realize that they're both English. And that's one of the beauties of Quebec. I think it's, it's Quebec and Montreal could be a beautiful society in that the average person gets along well and speaks to each other in both languages. And English-speaking Quebecers have become more and more bilingual over the past 30 years, which is a beauty of our society. But we still have many politicians and many um, zealots who are pushing this too far, and they see any trace of English as a threat to French, when in fact it's not. And that's the thing that many people don't understand, protecting the survival or the the viability of the French language in North America doesn't necessarily mean you have to trample on the rights of English speaking Quebecers. And that's where I think the government is going much too far with Bill 96. And many people that support Bill 96 uh, are going to quickly realize that it doesn't do much to protect French by suppressing English. Yeah, because, I mean, as we mentioned at the start, you know, you're, you're, you're also an architect, you're involved in business yourself. So, I mean, I guess people coming to, to Quebec, particularly maybe high paid, you know, sort of highly skilled individuals, because they're going to have to go through this language issue, they may say, well, I'm not taking a job there, or I'm not going to move my business there, or I'm going to move my business to another part of Canada. It's, it may, it's going to weaken the province economically. Yeah, you, you just put your finger on one of the key, key issues here. You know, everyone uh, since COVID in particular is, is facing a labor shortage, finding personnel, finding qualified labor for anything, finding tradespeople, finding professionals, researchers is extremely difficult everywhere. And uh, every, every country has to be bending over backwards to make themselves more appealing to outsiders, to immigrants to come here. But what we're doing is the opposite. We're telling uh, many people that if they come here, they're gonna be uh, forced into a straitjacket of a language regime where you might not be able to send your kids to the school of your choice. You won't be able to necessarily communicate with the state of the language of your choice. So what does that do? That shoots ourselves in the foot economically. Instead of trying to bring a qualified um, labor force to Quebec, we're sending them elsewhere. And that's, uh, that's where many Quebecers have to realize that we're hurting ourselves by being so rigid on language. I mean, we mentioned the Premier of Quebec, you know, Francois Legault. Um, in terms of him and his party, you know, how would you describe this move? Is it is almost like an a lingo nationalism? Because, like you say, it, it seems to be, uh, you know, push everything else out of the way, just focus on the language thing. Well, let's just focus on that and, and bring in this kind of draconian rule. You know, you know. I mean, how, how would you describe the politics? You know, you know, where are they are they? I'm assuming they're right wing, but you know, what is their politics? Because it seems a very I, I can't work out where they're going with this. Well, it's, it's nationalism, it's ethnocentric nationalism to a large degree, but uh, it's also interesting you're raising 
a, a very valid point. Uh, I write about it in my column this this week, this coming week, about how the um, the governing party of uh, François Legault, our premier, had their major policy convention last weekend. Uh, 1,200 delegates were there. There's an election, a provincial election in, in October, and all polls are showing that they will be reelected. But that last week, and so, you know, when a party knows that they're probably going to be reelected, you would think that they would roll up their sleeves and dig deep and really address some of the issues, the core issues that affect uh, everyone. And most uh, opinion polls show that the main issues affecting everyone, and it's like this in many countries post-COVID, are the healthcare system. Caring for seniors, the labor shortage, the increasing the cost of living, housing shortage, uh, infrastructure uh, issues. So instead of dealing with all those issues, those were all uh, cast off. And the government focused all weekend last week on nationalist pride, Quebec nationalist pride, how if we don't protect French language and culture, Quebec might become like Louisiana. Louisiana is a state in the U.S. that uh, used to have uh, a large francophone majority, but it has diminished over time and it's no longer a Franco majority. So he always uses that as his doomsday scenario. that if we don't bring in place these nationalist uh, rules and regulations, we might uh, just disappear or our language might perish. So that's certainly a complete and utter exaggeration. It's certainly not going to happen here in Quebec. But at the same time, they sacrificed all those main other issues of importance to Quebecers to focus on ethnic nationalism, identity politics, language politics, which dominated the policy convention last weekend. Yeah, I mean, and talk, talking about the politics, I mean, I've, I've actually been to the, you know, the parliament in Quebec, and when I went there, I couldn't believe that they only spoke in French. There, there's no English um, sessions. It's all in French. And I, I mean, I, you're a politician. I'm sure you've spoken both, but... I mean, I mean, how can you in a in a bio, in a in a, set, a major city like Montreal, which is which is bilingual, um, to only to only to the politicians to only choose to speak one language? It's it's staggering that to me it's been allowed to happen. Um, and I mean that with respect. I know French needs its place, but it seems English has been totally discarded over the last 15, 20, 25 years. Well, from the from the government point of view and the legislation, yes, there's always an a, an attempt to diminish the use of English. Um, in Quebec, and and it's just not seen the same way as it is in other places. Like in Europe, uh, speaking as many languages as possible is an asset. It's certainly a, a benefit. That people try to teach their kids as many languages as possible. Those that can speak uh, Chinese and Spanish are certainly going to have a leg up on the competition in any business environment in any competitive field. And and you would think that uh, you know Quebecers should should um, feel very fortunate that we have the opportunity to speak both languages. Uh, right here, and, and some uh, feel very much against it. They feel that, as I said earlier, it's a zero-sum game that in order to protect French, you have to suppress English. Uh, many people feel, and I agree wholeheartedly, that both languages reinforce each other, and both languages, if you speak both languages, it gives you an extra richness and advantage you have in any life endeavor, social endeavor, or business endeavor going forward. We've seen this. I mean, we, 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 you know, we've touched on how building six is going to affect the economy, but we have seen this because, I mean, if we if we look at and I'm, I'm using Montreal, I know Quebec is a big province, but obviously Montreal is the is the economic, you know, sort of heartland of it, and the major city. And I mean, it it held an Olympics in 1976. You know, it was a it was a it was a major powerhouse. It was it was maybe competing with New York on that on, on that east side of you know the the, the sort of mm -hmm. North American there and. Montreal has got gradually smaller. It hasn't become a bigger city. It's actually less than its international thing. And, and I think a lot of people feel it's because of this uh, pro, very pro-French um, attitude that it has become less than an international city and it's got less prominence. Well, for someone on that side of the pond, you certainly know a lot about uh, Montreal because you just you just touched on uh, a, a, another major issue. The fact that in, in the 1970s, Montreal was the biggest city in Canada. It was the most populous city in Canada. It was Canada's economic engine uh, in the 70s. And, and since uh, language legislation and, and governments that talk about uh, the possibility of taking Quebec out of Canada have come into place, um, these language legislation uh, and the number of people that have left have led to the decline of Montreal relative to other cities in Canada and, other, and in North America. Montreal was the city, it was the Olympic city in 1976. We used to have a championship uh, hockey parade. I know hockey's not maybe a big, a big, um, a big uh, sport where you're from, but uh, Montreal was the, the hockey champion, the New York Yankees uh, of, uh, of the National Hockey League back then, winning Stanley Cup championships every year and that has gone down because we've just lost uh, some of our economic strength and power relative to everywhere else. Um, we have 
hundreds of thousands of uh, English-speaking Quebecers have left because of these language laws. They've enriched other cities in Canada and in North America. Uh, head offices have left in large number, and Montreal is all the weaker, uh, certainly lags behind Toronto and Vancouver when it comes to Canadian cities now in both population, economic strength, uh, gross national product. Everything is, is less in Montreal relative to the rest of North America than it was uh, 40, 50 years ago. Are you laying out these things? I mean, I mean, it's. I think we're all taking it in. It's you know, you're you're saying it so succinctly, so eloquently. It's, it's quite simple to 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 break down. So why are like you said, the polls are showing that you know the the, the premier and his party are going to be reelected. Why are people supporting this then? You know, you know, what is it that they are seeing that we are not seeing? Well, there's a few there's a few reasons for that. Number one, there's five political parties represented in Quebec's national assembly. So the other four parties. Uh, are splitting off the rest of the vote. If you look at the overall numbers, the governing party still only has about 45% of the vote. The vote is being split by the others. So that's why they're cruising probably to, um, to a, a strong victory in October because the, other, the opposition is fractured. But, you know, populism right now, the premier speaks to popular, populism, pride about being a Quebecer, pride about the French language and culture. It resonates with a lot of people, even though it might not be their, their number one issue. It still resonates, but most importantly, this leader, especially during COVID, he projected a bit of a paternal figure. He was like the, the people, people felt, Quebecers felt was a, a source of stability guiding us through this, um, this health crisis, the pandemic for two years. So he's very popular personally, and that's translating into his party policies just being uh, uh, accepted by most Quebecers. But I think average, if you speak to the average French speaking Quebecer, they don't mind the presence of English. They get along. We get along together. We speak to each other. And many of them might even roll their eyes at the policies that this government is pushing forward, this Bill 96, thinking it goes too far. But at the same time, the, um, the, the opposition right now is very weak. So it looks as though this government will just coast to another victory in October. So without getting, you know, sort of too depressing and, you know, sort of bringing you down, you know, you know, what can you see going forward? Because, I mean, you know, that this Bill 96 has had royal assent. So it's, you know, it's it's obviously, you know, it's in there. You know, what can be done? You know, what do you think the, what's the best case scenario we're we looking at here for, for English speakers or the English language? Well, I think we need support from our Francophone, our French speaking uh, brothers and sisters out there to start questioning themselves to the government that maybe they've gone too far with Bill 96. Maybe it's not a fair piece of legislation. Maybe it's a piece of legislation that doesn't reflect the values of a modern democratic society. And I think that's step number one. We're starting to see a little bit of that in the French uh, press in the past week, people thinking that maybe this law goes a touch too far. When we start seeing it internationally, uh, also it's gonna start raising some alarm bells. There were some devastating uh, stories in the New York Times and the Washington Post in the last week about uh, some of the new rules on businesses. Every business with uh, 26 employees or more have to operate exclusively in French from now on. So that was uh, pinpointed in some of the international publications. And that uh, is a bit of a warning signal to the premier that more of that may uh, happen. You know, obviously you're doing your bit uh, from across uh, the Atlantic also to uh, educate uh, some of your viewers and listeners to what is going on as well. And I think uh, bringing pressure from abroad, bringing pressure from within, especially from Supreme Quebecers, might get the, um, the government to look at this and some sober second thought and recognize that perhaps uh, they're pulling the elastic too far. And if you pull the elastic too far, it just snaps. And you mentioned that thing, it was really interesting about, you know, a business over 26 people. So for, for example, yourself, you know, right now, if you stepped inside your office and you had an employee there and, and you spoke to him in English, could someone then report you and then you would, someone would come around and give you a fine. I mean, you know, what would be the punishment or the sanction if you spoke English in your in, in your place of employment, if it was over 26 employees? Well, that's that's one of the things now that's very troubling about this law. Right now, 26 employees or more, you would have to, you can speak to someone in English, but if you send out an email, for example, or communication, it has to be in both languages, with the French being predominant. Any, any uh, internal communications have to be uh, French first, and then you could have a second language, but you... But there are aspects of the law that says you have to confirm or prove why the second language is necessary. And then with that, it gives the what's called the Office de langue Française or the French language, people call it uh, the French language police, but the French language agency can actually, without a warrant, come in and do a search and seizure, search computers, search documents within any office environment to make sure that the law is being respected. And that's some great 
concern to many people that has been pointed out about Bill 96. What does that mean? What, how far reaching are those rules? Can they seize your personal computer to make sure that your, your company is complying with the rules and regulations associated with Bill 96? That's one of the things that, uh, that obviously is gonna find itself uh, through the courts over the next little while. And that's uh, you know, one of the byproducts of this law that will just create divisions and uh, animosity between Francophones and Anglophones. And um, my final thing to ask you was, I mean, I just asked you previously there about the best case scenario. So, you know, let's maybe, you know, sort of, uh, you know, you know, put our sort of uh, our depressing hats on and say, you know, what's the worst case scenario? I mean, I mean, do you think this could lead to mass amounts of people leaving? Can we, can we be looking at civil unrest? And I don't want that. And of course, we're not, we're not advocating that. But I mean, is, do, you, do you think this type of law could, you know, could see those things happen? Well, civil unrest, no. Um, we saw for the first time in a long time English being Quebecers marching in the streets in the thousands uh, a few weeks ago, which is not something we do very often. We're usually very uh, laid back and uh, and uh, and staid and, ca and calm, but uh, we saw that for the first time in a long time. So there's obviously a sense of concern. Uh, there won't be civil unrest, but there are liable to be many arguments and battles and skirmishes developing in certain situations, whether it's in a waiting room, if someone hears someone being spoken to in English by a doctor, for example, or by a hospital administrator, will they start to argue with them saying, you're not allowed to speak English here. That's gonna happen in stores because it creates this snitch bureaucracy also, where you can complain if you didn't get properly served in French in a store, you can complain about that. Or, or if you're in a store and you see someone else being served in French, Will that start an argument between two people? So I wouldn't say civil unrest, but I would say there's certainly um, situations where people might get into arguments. Municipalities also that don't have bilingual status or don't have a certain level of their population uh, that are English speaking aren't allowed to provide services anymore in English to their residents. So will that set off uh, arguments at a local city council meeting? So uh, civil unrest, no, but a lot of uh, territorialized uh, individual skirmishes and battles and arguments are certainly going to develop out of this. Well, thanks a lot, lot for your time, Robert. I mean, it's been very interesting. I mean, it's uh, it's one of those things that I think a lot of people might think quite surreal. I mean, it's uh, you know, I, I mean, it's um, it's essentially over a language, but it's going to have, as you say, it's going to have lots of um, shocks and ramifications. It's not it's not just about speaking a language. It's it, it, it's going to it's going to affect people's identities, their livelihoods, the way they think about themselves, how they feel in their homeland. It's it's going to this is really going to have a big ripple effect. Uh, this uh, this bill. Not only in uh, Quebec, but in Canada as well. I think Canada, by and, and one of the most unfortunate things is that the Canadian government itself, itself has stayed away from this, does not want to get its uh, feet wet or um, walk into this, this battle because language is a provincial jurisdiction. So the province of Quebec has jurisdiction over language, but the federal government, which has an official um, language policy or a policy on official bilingualism, you would think would have an interest in at least questioning whether or not the Quebec government is going too far. But our Canadian Prime Minister, uh, Justin Trudeau, has um, been very timid in getting involved in this, which is very disturbing. And I think it could have implications in the rest of Canada too. Francophone minorities in other provinces might uh, start to feel the heat or some regionalized prejudice because of what's going on in Quebec. And that might set off battles elsewhere. You know, interestingly enough, our Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, his father, uh, Pierre Elliott Trudeau, was Prime Minister of Canada for many, many years in the 70s and 80s. And he always championed individual rights and freedoms and, and official bilingualism. To see his son uh, hiding under the desk, uh, so to speak, uh, he would be turning over in his grave. It's very unfortunate that uh, uh, what's happening, and even our federal Prime Minister, the Prime Minister of Canada, is not coming uh, to defend the rights of Anglophone minorities in Quebec. That in itself is also tragic in many ways. Well, yeah, and, and I think to, to add to that, I mean, if people are not aware, you know, Justin Trudeau is obviously from Quebec. I mean, he's, so he's, he's right. not only, not only does, does, he, does he understand it on a legal level, he, he, he understands it on a personal level because mm -hmm. he's like you, bilingual, he, he knows about it. So I, I'm, I'm surprised he's not jumped in more because he thought it's, it's his homeland, literally. He thought he'd be in there sort of at least offering his opinion. You know, the federal government uh, sometimes curries favor of Quebec nationalism because they feel that they don't want to upset the apple cart, they don't want to rock the boat, so that uh, the majority of Quebecers will vote for them in the next federal election. But, uh, you know, you're, you're playing fire with the future of the country, with the very essence of Canada. The essence of Canada is official bilingualism, the two founding nations, French and English. 
And when you're allowing one of those uh, founding nations to pass legislation that infringes on the rights of the other, it's a recipe for disaster. And in my view, it, it cracks the foundation of what makes Canada a great country. Yeah, well, thank you so much again, Robert, for your time. It's been a pleasure. Um, I encourage everyone to, I know you're online, but you, you've also got your columns in the, in the Montreal Gazette. Um, I, would, I would encourage anyone to go on and read them and sort of, you know, hear your insight and your, your analysis. And uh, it's been great talking to you. So thank you very much for taking the time. Very much a pleasure, Chris. Uh, don't hesitate next time. Pleasure. Thank you.